Well, we are considering uh, this passage uh, this morning, and uh, we've seen how in this section Isaiah has been focusing upon a, a man called Cyrus, this pagan king, the most powerful man in the world at the time, um, this Persian ruler who will be an instrument in God's hand. He will be the servant of the Most High. He will not be a believer in the Lord, but he will fulfill the Lord's plan. He will be the instrument that will be used to deliver the people from Babylon. Remember that 70 year long exile that they had in Babylon? Well, Cyrus will be the man who the Lord will raise up, who will bring freedom for God's people. But Cyrus, at his very best, will only be a political deliverer. He could not deal with the sin of the nation of Israel. And as we saw last week, there is no peace for the wicked. So even if the people return back from Babylon to Israel, they still have a fundamental problem. Who can deal with their sin? Who can make them right with God? Who can deal with our sin? Who can make us right with God? Who can deal with the problem of the human heart? And so in this section, the focus is upon the servant of the Lord, and we are considering another servant song. We've already come across one. If you think way back to Isaiah 42, in Isaiah 42, we are told of the servant of the Lord. We are told that he will be chosen by the Lord and sent and upheld by him. He will be given, endued with the spirit of the Lord, so he will be enabled to minister effectively. He will be humble and gentle of heart, a bruised reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. This servant will deal tenderly with a needy people, those who are hurting, those who are broken, those who are weak and frail will know the compassionate help of this servant and he will be determined to fulfill the work that he has been given. He will bring justice and salvation to the nations. What a wonderful statement we find in Isaiah 42 of the work and the person of the Lord Jesus. Now, in Isaiah 49, Again, we are being focused upon the servant of the Lord. And the servant speaks, and he has a unique testimony. And before we actually look at his ministry, there are some key things we, we need to understand about this servant of the Lord. So we're going to look this morning at the testimony of the servant. But first of all, Let's look at verse 1. His demand to be heard. Listen to me, O coastlands, and give attention, you peoples, from afar. So clearly, within context, the servant of the Lord is now speaking. And there is a demand that he is to be heard. And I suppose we could pass over this command, listen to me, just as a, an ordinary statement. But we've seen in Isaiah, particularly in this section, that the Lord God is the one who demands to be heard. The Holy One of Israel, the Lord God Almighty, he's the one that this phrase is always referring to, listen to me, hear me. We saw it last week, didn't we? Um, emphasized in Isaiah 48. Wherever else Isaiah employs this exact phrase, we find that the speaker is God and God alone. So the very clear 
The implication here is that the servant is speaking and he's speaking with the voice of God. So here is one who's speaking with a divine voice and he demands that he's heard. And his voice is to be heard throughout the world. Not just in Israel, but the, the coastlands refer to far off distant places and that's emphasized with you peoples from afar so here's a servant a servant of the Lord and he's speaking with the voice of God and all peoples are to listen to him and so here we have a glimpse of one who is divine and speaks clearly. But then we are also told something else. His choosing. Look at, again, verse 1. The Lord called me from the womb. From the body of my mother, he named my name. So here we are told something else and something interesting. He speaks with a divine voice, but he's one who is to be born. And even in the womb, he's called and he's named. Who can possibly speak with a divine voice and be born, be born of a woman? Here's one who's fully human and yet fully divine, fully God. This servant is someone very special indeed, is he not? I wonder how Isaiah would have understood this. Did he understand what he was actually writing? Did his contemporaries understand what is being emphasized here that this servant is going to come and he's going to be God and man? And who is this servant? Well, of course, we, we know from New Testament lights there is no shadow of doubt who this person is. It is, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ. Fully God and fully man. His voice is to be heard and embraced. When he speaks, he speaks the words of God. When he works, he does the works of God. He's one person with two natures. He's both divine and he's human. And his mother is referred to, and we, we know that he is born of a virgin in a miraculous way as the Holy Spirit works. And he comes as the servant of, the God, uh, of God, and he comes with authority and humility. And as you read through the New Testament, you see this amazing combination of divinity and humanity in the Lord Jesus Christ. And there are some times where his humanity is focused upon, and sometimes his divinity is focused on, and sometimes in, in one passage the, the two are focused upon. So, for example, in Mark 4, when the Savior is in that boat and he's exhausted, he's been teaching all day and he's exhausted and he falls asleep because as a human being, he's tired and the storm comes and he's awakened from his sleep. And with one word, he calms the wind and the waves. Why? Because he's the divine, eternal son of God. He is one who is God and man, fully God, fully man. And what a wonderful thing it is to see it in the Old Testament, if we have eyes to see it, it's there clearly for us to understand. Now let's look at verse 2, uh, where we read of the, the testimony of the servant and his ministry. Here we read, he, that's God, made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand he hid me. He made me a polished arrow in his quiver, he hid me 
away. So here two very powerful symbols of the way that the, the servant of the Lord will, will speak. He will speak like a sharp sword and like a polished arrow. So here's one who speaks as the spokesman of God. He will speak with the greatest power and the greatest authority. So when Jesus taught, the crowds were amazed because no one taught as he taught. And these two pieces of equipment that are used to picture the way that he will speak, I believe we are right to, to see uh, two illustrations being brought here. A sharp sword, a sword is a, a near instrument. So he will have a ministry to his own people, to Israel. That's the, the near instrument. And the polished arrow, an arrow is fired at some distance. He will have a, a ministry not only to his own people, to the Jews, but also to the Gentiles. And his words will, will penetrate and travel far. And we see this being outworked in our passage. He will have a, a ministry to Israel in verse 5, and he will be a light to the Gentiles in verse 6. And I don't believe it's a fanciful interpretation of what's being said here in verse 2. And of course we know in the New Testament, we, we read there in Hebrews 4 verse 12, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. So as God speaks, as the word of God comes to us this morning, our hearts are exposed. I said last week, there is no hiding from the God who sees all things. And his word comes to us, and sometimes his word cuts and cuts deeply and reveals what's really going on inside our hearts. And we should expect that and, and want that. Sometimes coming to, to worship under the sound of God's word is a painful, humbling experience. It's not always a pleasant, comforting truth. Sometimes there's the convicting work of the Holy Spirit, and that's the mercy and grace of God if we are led to repent and seek the Lord and flee from our sins. So there is a penetration and an effectiveness of the words of this servant. A well-polished polished arrow is, a staff, is an arrow which has a, a staff that is clean, so it'll fly directly and straightly and not miss its target. We are told in Psalm 64 verse 7 how God frustrates the plans of the wicked and the godless. We read, but God shoots his arrow at them and they are wounded suddenly. Or we could think of King Ahab. Remember him, that wicked, godless king? He had to go and fight in a battle, so he disguised himself as an enemy uh, against the enemy as an ordinary soldier. And then a, an enemy soldier took a random shot of his arrow, and it penetrated his armor, and Ahab died. Here's the sword of the servant as he speaks, it penetrates. Here's the arrow of the servant and it penetrates into the hearts. The servant is well prepared and well equipped for his mission. And friends, before I move off this point, let me say this. Listen to the words of the servant. Listen to the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Obey his words. Treasure them. Live by them and and die by them. He speaks and listening to his voice, new life the dead receive. This mighty servant of the Lord, the Lord Jesus, is speaking this morning. Oh, that we all would have ears to hear his 
voice. And then, as we go on into verse 3, we see the, the matchlessness or the uniqueness of the servant. And he said to me, You are my servant Israel, in whom I will be glorified. So the servant now identifies himself as being Israel. And what are we to make of this? Who exactly is this servant declaring himself to be? Is this the the nation of Israel that's in view? Or is this someone else? Well, just looking down a, a few verses... Verse 5, we read this, And now the Lord says, He who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring back Jacob to him, and that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honoured in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has become my strength. So here's an Israel who's being distinguished from Israel. Do you see how it's working here? And we're also told in verse 3 that this Israel is the one in whom the Lord will be glorified. So is this servant the nation of Israel? Or is it, as I've already inferred, is it speaking about the Lord Jesus? Well, I think you know where I'm leading you in what I'm saying. God chose Abraham to be the head of his chosen people through whom the nations of the world would be blessed as part of God's plan, Genesis 12. And as you read through the history of the Old Testament, you will see again and again a history of failure where the the purpose of God seems to be narrowed down from a nation to a believing remnant to ultimately to an individual that is being referred to here through whom the Lord will be glorified. The servant of the Lord is the very essence of what Israel was meant to be, the one in whom God would be fully pleased and fully glorified. Jesus was and is everything that God wanted his people to be. He and he alone matches up to what Israel was called to be. Indeed, he is the true Israel. And Jesus could make this so clear of himself because he could take very clear metaphors that referred to Israel and apply them to himself. Let me give you one example. Jesus said, I am the true vine. And if you know anything from the Old Testament, you will know that Israel was often referred to as a vine, often an unfruitful vine. Earlier on in Isaiah chapter 2, for example, you have the song of the the vineyard, which is a lament of the unfaithfulness that Israel showed. I am the true vine. Jesus could point to himself and say, I am the embodiment of all that God would want for his people. And Jesus, when he comes, he identifies with the people of God. He was born as a Jew. And as he determines to go to the cross to save and to redeem all who will trust in him, he takes the the sin and the unworthiness of all of his people that trust in him. And he deals with sin and he satisfies God's wrath. And as he makes the ultimate sacrifice... He glorifies God as he dies in our place. Jew and Gentile are brought together as one people in Jesus, the true vine, the true Israel, the true servant of the Lord. And then as we move on into verse 4, we see something very interesting. We see his, his discouragement and despondency and how he dealt with it. Look at verse 4. But I said, this is the servant speaking, I have labored in vain. I've spent my strength for nothing and vanity, yet surely my right is with the Lord and my recompense is with my God. Now, 
we need to be careful here. We are on holy ground and we need to tread very, very carefully. But as I said on Thursday night, this verse is implying that Jesus knew disappointment. He knew discouragement. Now, he never fell into sinful discouragement. He never, never sinned. But it is possible to be discouraged and not sin. Can you imagine what it would have been like for the Lord Jesus in his sinless humanity to live in this broken, sin, sinful world? He was the greatest teacher that ever taught. And his words were so often twisted and ignored and he was despised and he was rejected and he was a man of sorrows do you remember when Jesus healed the man with the withered hand one Sabbath day in the synagogue and they were looking for a reason to accuse him uh, to see what Jesus would do whether it was lawful for him to heal on the Sabbath in Mark chapter 3 verse 5 do you know how Jesus reacted. He looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, and said to the man, stretch out your hand, and he stretched it out, and his hand was restored. Does, not, does that not suggest that he was discouraged and disappointed by what he saw? Tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. Or again, when he's approaching Jerusalem, and he laments over it. Uh, Matthew 23, 37. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often I would have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you would not. Isn't that the pain of disappointment present there in the Saviour? Or when he met with Nicodemus. Isn't there a certain measure of disappointment to be found in his question to Nicodemus, the, the ruler of the Jews, in John 10, John 3, verse 10? Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet do you not understand these things? Or on the Mount of Transfiguration, where his divine glory shone through his humanity and the disciples saw something of his godness and his majesty shining through. He comes down off the mountain and immediately he is confronted with his disciples who cannot deliver a demon-possessed boy. And in Matthew 17, verse 17, we read, And Jesus answered, O faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him here to me. Or one other illustration. On that night of nights, where Jesus is telling his disciples that he's going to the cross and he's preparing them and he's taught them in context for three years and he's revealed who he is and he's proved who he is by the works that he's done. And then Philip said to him in John 14 verse 8, Lord, show us the Father, and it's enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? I cannot but hear the sound of disappointment there in the Saviour's reply. He went to his own people, and his own people did not receive him, rejected all of his life, lied about, forsaken, betrayed, even by his closest followers. And yet he did not ever, ever fall into sinful discouragement. He trusted he maintained his trust in the Lord. He was sustained by the Holy Spirit. He looked to the Lord and his life is a great example to us that 
in the midst of disappointment and discouragement. We can look to Jesus. He knows and he understands and he can bring great grace to us. On Thursday night, I I touched on dealing with discouragement. And uh, let me repeat some of what I said there for your benefit. How can discouraged Christians be helped? Well, firstly, we recognize we are living in a disappointing world. Get used to it. It will do you good. In this world, you will know discouragement and disappointment. I also said... As long as Christ is dwelling in your heart, you have the resources to get you through anything in life. We might know great distress. We might be brokenhearted. We might be overwhelmed by life and circumstance. We might be here this morning with such heavy burdens on our heart. And yet Jesus promises he will not forsake us and he will uphold and he will sustain and faith in Christ does not remove all causes of discouragement. It's not that as believers we, we, ever, we, we, we never get discouraged. No. Rather, our faith in the Lord Jesus enables us to overcome them. We may experience discouragement, but we will not be defeated by it if we look to the Lord Jesus. And in our brokenness, in our sorrows, In our discouragements, Jesus meets us right there. And he can meet you right where you are this morning. Let's look at his victory. So as he trusted in the Lord, as he pressed on, as he finished the work that he was sent to do, This servant of the Lord is victorious. Look at verses 5 and 6. There you've got a a great statement of the victory of the Lord. And and look at this last part, this verse 6. It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and and to bring back the preserved of Israel I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach the end of the earth. Isn't that wonderful news? Here's a servant and his ministry is, yes, it will be to to Israel. The The believing remnant of Israel will be called and will be saved. But the light of this servant's ministry will go to the ends of the earth and the Lord will be glorified throughout the earth. So the servant's confidence is in the Lord. He knows what the Lord has called him to and he relies in the Lord in order to carry out his mission successfully. So his confidence is not in, is in not what he sees working out but in the promises of God. And I I believe one of the ways the Saviour was sustained in his earthly ministry was seeing the the promises, knowing the extent and spread of the gospel throughout all the nations. He committed himself to the promises of God and pressed on even in the midst of rejection and discouragement. His mission was to seek and to save that which was lost and to save a people to himself and lose not one in order that he would be glorified and God would be glorified. And has this promise been fulfilled? Has there been light for the nations? Has the salvation of this servant reached to the end of the earth? Well, the answer to that is a resounding yes. You just need to look round this small hall this morning. And there are so many nations here this morning, I don't want to name them all because I'm going to miss one out and I'll, I will offend someone. But, but even in a small gathering like this, uh, people from... Asia and South America and 
and Europe brought together under the light of the ministry of the servant. We today are beneficiaries of this prophecy, of this promise being outworked and fulfilled in the Lord Jesus. And that surely must encourage us with great encouragement this morning. And then we look at the Lord's response to his servant's testimony. And this goes on to the rest of the chapter, which we'll not look at this morning. God willing, we'll return back to Isaiah 49 next week. But here the Lord speaks about his servant. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and his Holy One, to the one deeply despised and abhorred by the nation. So as I said, here's the servant. He's rejected. He's a man of sorrows. He's acquainted with grief. He went to his own people and they did not receive him. Did this invalidate his ministry? Was he overwhelmed in discouragement? No, he was not. The determined purpose of the sovereign God was that his servant would be exalted. That every knee would bow before King Jesus. That the nations would come to him and Jesus would reign and be victorious. Kings shall See and arise princes, and they shall prostrate, they shall bow themselves because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. The never ending glorious victory of Jesus, the powerful and the strong, the kings and the princes, they will bow. Before him, even if he is rejected, he will not fail. And he ultimately will bring glory to God. And we see, don't we, throughout, especially in the New Testament, Gentiles flowing to the gospel of grace and to the Savior. And we would join with kings and princes, and we would bow, we would prostrate ourselves before this great king and this great savior. We would do so willingly because if we are believers, we understand the glory of the grace of the salvation that we have received through the finished work of this servant of the Lord. He calls us to trust him, to follow him, to love him, to obey him. He has been speaking this morning. His divine voice has been heard. And in one sense, the ministry of the suffering servant is very simple to call people to repentance, to call us to bow before him in faith and repentance that we would see the Lord's salvation today. The suffering servant continues to call his people to repent and to trust in the promises of God through him. Not only at conversion, but throughout our entire lives. We should expect as we gather each Sunday that Jesus is made much of and our hearts are captured by his glory and his grace. Let's be faithful to his call to to follow him and to bow before him, that we would be counted members of his church, his body, his people. Let's look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, and indeed rejoice that the Lord is king. And we listen to this him being sung as uh, we stand when the music is played. The Lord is King, lift up your voice.